Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today for the importance of insulating system solutions for LNG and cryogenic applications. I'm Kelsey Buchanan, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive into introductions, I would like to go over a few logistics. If you have any questions or concerns throughout the webinar, you may submit them at any point during the presentation during the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will address these questions live at the end of the presentation. Additionally, we will follow the webinar today with a survey. This is your opportunity to provide us with feedback on how we did today. Ask any additional questions you may have about the topic of the webinar or suggest new topics for webinars that you'd like to hear in the future. We are continuously striving to improve and evolve our webinars. So if you have any comments or suggestions as how to we, we can better um, accomplish this, or even if you feel like we've missed the mark today, we'd encourage you to fill out the survey. We use your feedback to improve our webinars and provide the information that has the most value to you. This survey is also part of how we deliver the JM experience. The JM experience is based on four pillars of the JM culture people, passion, perform, and protect. And we believe it's critical to make sure we hear, understand, and respond to your needs in order to deliver the best interaction to you. We offer webinars like this one to help educate the market and offer a tool and a resource for you and your business. But we understand that this isn't just a one-way street. So your feedback is a key component to helping us evolve to better meet um, your needs. Also, we frequently ask whether, or, or we get frequently asked whether or not we send out these presentations upon their conclusion. While we do not send out the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online for you to watch at your leisure or share with your colleagues that maybe um, wasn't able to attend today. And this ensures you that you have the full presentation within its full context. So uh, with that, we'll dive into some introductions. Joining me today is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Sheehan and Heather Sharif. Elizabeth, could you start us off with an introduction? Yeah, good morning, everybody, um, or rather good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for everyone for attending this webinar. Um, we appreciate your time today. I have been um, at JAM for about seven years. I am an associate product manager for our industrial business, and I'm specifically focused on our metal and foam product lines. Heather? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Heather Sharif. I have been with JM for a total of five years, um, but started off my career with ITW insulation uh, systems. Um, I provide the technical support for uh, not only HVAC and mechanical, um, but also building insulation and then all of industrial, which will include metal and foam. Great. Okay. We will jump right in here. So we're going to begin the webinar talking about these topics today, which include LNG pipe systems, design criteria, system design, materials, installation, and maintenance. And then throughout the webinar, Heather and I will be taking turns um, on the different topics. So first, let's jump right into LNG pipe insulation systems. All right, sorry guys. Okay, so we're gonna start with what makes an LNG pipe installation system unique. Um, so while there are other applications that operate at even colder temperatures, such as liquid nitrogen, LNG pipe insulation systems are unique for a number of reasons. The insulated pipes within an LNG system operate at very cold temperatures. So typically negative 265 degrees Fahrenheit but the systems themselves are very often located in hot and humid climates. So these two opposing temperature extremes create a huge driving force for both heat gain and water vapor movement through the insulation toward the pipe. Additionally, LNG systems often involve very large pipe systems, both in diameter, which can get up to 48 inches, as well as pipe length. And some of the loading lines at LNG terminals can be over a mile long. And lastly, these LNG facilities are designed for long lifespans, and the insulation systems must be designed to last for the life of the facility. So the insulation systems must be able to function properly for more than 20 to 30 plus year lifespans. So 
So given that you need any LNG pipe insulation system to last upwards of 20 or 30 years, the LNG pipe insulation itself is a complete and engineered system and must be very carefully designed, installed, and maintained. The key aspects of this design system are shown here, and again, we will cover all of them today. So that was a quick overview of LNG pipe insulation systems, and now we're gonna continue on to design criteria next. The design criteria of LNG insulation systems are the issues that must be considered when performing the insulation system design. The first one of these seems trivial, but is actually quite important. Why are the cryogenic LNG pipes being insulated? For what purpose? And there are many possible reasons, but the two most often considered critical in LNG applications are shown in blue at the top, which are condensation control and process control to limit heat gain to reduce boil off gas. By designing an insulation system to accomplish these two goals, all of the other reasons to insulate that are shown on this slide will also consequently be largely accomplished. So there are many other design criteria that uh, must be considered, including specifications, code compliance, desired service life, ambient and physical environment, operating conditions, and the inspection and maintenance plan. However, the most important design criterion that must be considered is where the facility owner or specifier wants to operate on what we call the cost performance continuum. An insulation system with higher performance has more redundancy, better materials, and better system design built into it. So redundancy helps to prevent problems, and if a problem does occur, redundancy quote unquote, buys an owner time to find the problem prior to irreparable system damage. This damage is most often caused by water or water vapor entrance into the insulation system, which causes loss of insulating ability, ice formation, physical damage to the insulation system, and other problems. Higher performance costs more upfront, but in LNG system applications, these costs are usually justified through lower life cycle costs achieved primarily by yielding a longer lasting insulation system. So while the decision on where to operate on this cost performance continuum is ultimately up to the specifier, JM recommends a higher performance LNG pipe insulation system design. And this is actually what is usually done for more for LNG facilities. So next I'm gonna turn it over to Heather for the details behind system design. I apologize, I did not unmute. Um, so the system design, the materials of construction are not just the selection of the insulation that's gonna be used, but also all of the various components of the insulation system that you'll see here. Today, when we discuss the materials, we're only going to have time to focus on the main three, which are shown in blue, which is insulation, vapor retarders, and jacketing. We'll mention some of the other materials briefly throughout the presentation, but our focus is gonna be on these three. The other material categories are important and JM would be more than happy to discuss them with you offline in greater detail. We just won't have enough time today to do that. So an, another key design decision is the total insulation thickness and the number of layers required. The total thickness is driven by design criteria, which is usually condensation control and heat gain limits, but also by the insulation material used. As we will see later, there is a wide range of thermal conductivity and hence insulating ability among the insulation materials that are commonly used in LNG pipe. The number of layers used will either be two or three layers. For the two most commonly used LNG materials, which are PIR, polyisocyanurate, 
or cellular glass. Whether it is two or three layers depends on the total insulation thickness required. For a total thickness less than five to six inches, a double layer system would be used, which you can see on the left. A total insulation thickness above five to six inches is typically going to be a triple layer system, which you can see in the figure on the right. So another design decision that has to be discussed is how to stagger the insulation joints. This applies to both the circumferential or butt joints as well as the longitudinal joints. JM recommends that all joints between all layers be staggered. In the top two pictures, you can see the recommended method for staggering the butt joints. Requiring the butt joints to be staggered in this manner between layers improves not only the integrity of the system, but it also impedes water and water vapor entry through these joints by forcing the water entering the system to take a more torturous path when going through the staggered joints that you see on the left. The bottom picture shows the recommended staggering design for those longitudinal joints. The longitudinal joints in each layer should be staggered by about 90 degrees from the joint that it's adjacent to in the next layer. As with the butt joints, staggering the longitudinal joints in this manner, once again, makes a more torturous path for water entry. In addition to the joints in the outermost layer, you need to consider the location of those joints. The outermost layer, typically the joints are going to be located at the three and nine o'clock positions on the pipe. And that is because the forces that are exerted on the pipe are most likely to occur at the top of the pipe at 12, possibly at the lower end at six, if you've got something like saddle or saddle hangers. So here you can just see some pictures of joint staggering. Um, the picture on the left shows the butt joint staggered at an elbow location. And then the picture at the right, if you look close enough towards the bottom of the yellow trimer, you can show that inner longitudinal joint is at the six and or 12 o'clock position, whichever way this photo was taken, um, within the neighboring insulation, having those joints at a slightly different angle closer to three o'clock. It's not quite 90, but it is definitely sufficient. So more discussion about staggering of the longitudinal joints. Here you can see a drawing of how we would stagger both the butt and longitudinal joints of curved segments that are gonna be typically used on larger pipe sizes. In both pictures, you can once again see the staggering of the longitudinal joints by about 50% of um, the circumference of each curved segment. And then in the right-hand picture, you can see that, that both the inner and the outer layer of insulation also have their butt joints staggered. So another key design aspect is going to be the design of the insulation joints and the requirements for how and where joint sealant is applied. So flat insulation joints have historically been the most commonly used type. Um, and the pictures on the slide shows these type of joints. However, there are alternatives such as shiplap or tongue and groove that can also be used. Um, in our experience, proper installed flat joints are usually sufficient. Um, as I mentioned, you can see what flat joints look like in the pictures. The specs should typically require that the joint sealant be applied as a thin, even layer across the entire joint face. The thinness minimizes the ability of the joint sealant to act as a thermal short and transfer large amounts of heat through it. The even application across the entire joint face maximizes both the joint strength and joint resistance to the water movement. Lastly, the joint sealant is typically not used on 
the innermost layer with a PIR insulation, but is required on all the joints on both the second and third layer in a multi-layer system. So the reason for this is because it allows the innermost layer, which is gonna see the greatest temperature change from installation to operating temperatures, best accommodate the expansion and contraction. In the left picture, you can see that there is no joint sealant being applied uh, to the innermost layer, while the right picture shows the use of joint sealants on that second layer. Where joint sealant is used, it should be applied once again as a thin layer across the entire joint face. Another design aspect that should be considered are going to be contraction joints. There are many designs for and opinions about where contraction joints should be used. Um, they are most commonly used in the second and third layers of PIR insulations. Um, JM can definitely assist with the design and spacing for these. They're usually constructed by filling a smaller annual annular gap be between the adjacent insulation pieces. It's a maximum of one inches. And then it is filled with mineral fiber insulation that's going to be twice the final width of the joint. And then it's compressed to fill that, that cavity. If the gap opens up due to contraction, the thought is that the mineral fiber will then expand to also fill that gap. Um, expansion joints in adjacent layers, once again, need to be staggered from each other, just like the joints have been that we previously discussed. The next design aspect is going to be pipe supports. Um, insulation must be used at pipe supports and it can take and look like many forms. Most commonly, they are gonna be a high density uh, PIR or polyurethane, usually known as a PUD um, at the supports. The PUD density can typically range from about 10 to 20 pounds per cubic foot. With a higher density though, you are going to have a higher compressive strength, but in return, it's going to have a poor insulating ability. So for this, JM typically recommends letting us help do some calculations for those pipe supports with the possibility of being able to use one of our higher density versions of our trimer PIR. Um, this PIR typically ranges anywhere from four pounds to six pound density range. But using this can often yield to an acceptable strength at the supports without sacrificing the insulating ability. On rare occasions, the super strong resin that's impregnated with wood can also be used, um, but this is going to have a very, very poor insulating ability. Another key design aspect is going to be the selection and design of the vapor retarder systems. This is of one of the more important aspects um, to not only the performance of the LNG system, but also to the longevity of it. We will definitely be discussing vapor retarder material choices later. The system designer must design, must decide how many vapor retarders to use and where they are going to be located. Typically in a system, you have a primary vapor retarder that's used on the outside of the outermost insulation layer. And then you have a secondary vapor retarder that is used under the outermost layer of insulation in a three layer system. So that would be between the second and the third layer of insulation. Um, examples of secondary vapor retarders would be a mylar film or a PAP. Um, primary vapor retarders tend to be a butyl rubber or a mastic fabric mastic. The system designer is also going to have to determine how the vapor retarders will be closed and sealed and held in place. Vapor retarders used on elbows and fittings might differ from that that is on the straight pipe. So for example, a fabric reinforced mastic with a minimum of two coats mastic with reinforced fabric. 
Um, the picture here, uh, you can actually see that the secondary vapor retarder applied and it's joint sealed. They're oriented to naturally shed water. Um, it also shows that the third layer of PIR is also being installed. Over the third layer, you would then have the primary vapor retarder that will be installed. And then on the far side, you can see that the protective metal jacketing is going on. The next aspect in the design is going to be the locate is the design and location of the vapor stops. The key purpose of a vapor stop is to isolate any damage caused by water penetration into the insulation system. Vapor stops are typically required at specific places in LNG piping, such as on either side of valves or flanges. In addition, they're also recommended to be located periodically through long runs of pipe. The frequency of vapor stops use is going to depend on where the specifier wants to perform on the cost performance continuum that we previously mentioned. In the left picture here, you can see the vapor stop applied to a triple layer staggered butt joint that's on either side of the flange. Um, and then in the right picture, uh, or drawing, you can see the details of one of the standard designs for a vapor stop. We won't be discussing any of the details of vapor stop design today, but the key is that a vapor stop seals at the end of the insulation and connects the pipe to the primary vapor retarder, and it's going to have a low permeance barrier to longitudinally um, pass the, the water and the water vapor. The last um, aspect of the system design is going to be metal jacketing. We will discuss the selection of metal jacketing later, but it should be noted that your metal jacketing joints need to be oriented to naturally shed water and or to face away from any prevailing winds. Um, there are many other aspects of LNG pipe insulation system design that we haven't discussed today, and we would definitely be able to and willing discuss those um, in detail with you if you need them to be. And next, I believe that we will turn our attention to material and material selections from Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks, Heather. So Yes, we are going to jump into materials used in an LNG pipe insulation system and selection of these materials. So Heather just introduced you to a lot of those materials. We're going to jump in a little deeper now here. All right, so as we previously mentioned, there are many different types of materials used in LNG pipe insulation systems but we are today talking mainly about the three shown here in blue, which are um, insulation, vapor retarders, and jacketing. We're gonna start this section by discussing the important criteria to consider when selecting insulation materials. Remember the main purpose of the insulation is to reduce heat flow, although it also aids in reducing water entry into the insulation system. Insulation performance depends on many factors, and unfortunately, there is no perfect insulation material that excels at all factors. Some of the factors that are important when choosing an insulation material are density, thermal conductivity, which is commonly called K factor, chemical and water resistance, cost, availability, and thickness. And the selection of an insulation material should be based on the relative importance of each of these factors to your specific um, situation. So consider your design criteria and where you wanna operate on the cost performance continuum when you're making this choice. Now we're gonna discuss the most common pipe insulation types used in LNG systems. Far and away, the two most commonly used insulation materials in LNG pipe applications are polyisocyanurate which Heather mentioned is commonly named PIR, and cellular glass, or cell glass for short. Johns Manville makes a premier grade of PIR for use in LNG applications called Trimer 2500. And conversely, the use of cellular glass on LNG pipe is 
quite small compared to the much more often used PIR. Jumping into the similarities and differences of these materials, both PIR and cell glass are closed cell. The density of PIR is roughly one third that of cellular glass. So insulation systems based on PIR weigh a lot less than cell glass systems. PIR is easy to fabricate both in the shop and in the field and is comparatively quick and easy to install. Cellular glass is harder to fabricate for several reasons. Obviously it's made of glass, which requires special tools, it comes in smaller pieces, and upon being cut, it actually releases um, quite an unfavorable odor. PIR is significantly lower in cost as well per board foot, which is the pricing unit typically used um, by the manufacturers. Specifically looking at thickness, the better lower thermal conductivity of PIR leads to a lower insulation thickness being required compared to cellular glass. So this in turn leads to less material being required for PIR, which therein yields lower material costs. And if you look at the graph on this slide, it shows an example of the thickness of PIR and cell glass needed for a typical LNG scenario at various levels of relative humidity. Of course, as a relative humidity increases, the thickness required for both materials increases. And this increase begins at about 87 to 88% relative humidity. But at all levels of relative humidity, the thickness required for cellular glass is still 1.5 to 2 inches greater than that of PIR. And converting this thickness into an amount of material required, the cell glass would require about 28% more material that would, than would an insulation system based on PIR. Now let's consider how the K factors of several LNG insulation, sorry, several LNG insulation materials translate into total thickness required and the number of layers required. As mentioned on the previous slide, the superior or lower thermal conductivity of PIR compared to cellular glass translates directly into a lower thickness being used. But this thickness reduction is only part of the story, right? Using PIR insulation also yields an overall outer insulation circumference that is 10 to 20% smaller than that of cell glass. This smaller outer circumference means that less material is then used for joint sealants, vapor retarders, metal jacketing, et cetera. Now let's take a look at the total insulation thickness and number of insulation layers required for PIR, cellular glass, and actually a relative newcomer to the LNG pipe insulation party called silica aerogel. For the reasonable climatic scenario described in the table on this slide, you can see the insulation thickness required for each material. The greatest thickness required is for cellular glass, while the very low K factor of aerogel yields the lowest thickness. However, total thickness isn't the end of the story. Look at the last column in the table, which shows the number of layers that must be installed for each material. For the PIR and cell glass, there are three layers needed. However, even though the total thickness required for the aerogel is the smallest, the number of layers that have to be each individually installed is 12, which is four times the number of layers of the PIR and cell glass. And the reason for this is that the aerogel comes in a maximum layer thickness of only 10 millimeters, which is less than half an inch, and therefore using aerogel requires using more layers to obtain the desired K factor. Moving on to installed cost, compared head-to-head, -head, PIR is a more economical insulation solution for LNG pipe than cellular glass. PIR is less costly, and because cell glass comes in shorter sections than PIR, you have to install 50% more pieces of cell glass in a given run of pipe. This increase in number of pieces means that there are more joints that have to be sealed, which therefore means greater labor costs to install and more joints to potentially leak in the future. The better lower K factor of PIR also drives a lot of beneficial cost factors. PIR is used at a thinner total thickness, uses fewer layers than aerogel, is the least costly LNG insulation material used, and requires less of the expensive accessories compared to cell glass like vapor retarder, jacketing, and sealants. The thinner total thickness of PIR compared to cell glass can also be of benefit for space savings 
in the LNG facility itself. All right, moving right along, um, insulation system cost is, of course, only part of what has to be considered when selecting a material. Performance and therefore service life is also of great importance. The performance of PIR insulation in LNG applications is outstanding. PIR in general and trimer PIR specifically has been used in the majority of the world's LNG facilities where it has demonstrated 20 to 30 plus years of service life. Ultimately, PIR insulation on LNG pipes works well and has worked well in hundreds of North American and global facilities for many decades. The next material we are going to discuss is the vapor retarders. Selection of vapor retarder must be based on its permeance, which simplistically is the rate at which water vapor passes through the vapor retarder. Since the main purpose of a vapor retarder is to severely limit water vapor movement toward the pipe, the permeance of the vapor retarder system is its most important property. Permeance is measured in units of perms and a lower value or perm rating is better. So continuing on the topic of permeance, the typical requirement for the vapor retarders on an LNG pipe insulation system is a permeance of less than or equal to 0.01 perms. However, watch out for ideal lab performance compared to actual real world field performance. There are vapor retarder materials which might have a lab result of 0.01 perms with no joints present and set in a carefully controlled flat test geometry in a lab and you'd probably be led to think that this is perfect vapor retarder for your project, but it might not work well in your actual LNG application due to a rugged real world environment and the presence of so many joints. So just something to consider. In addition to its permeance, there are other important attributes of a vapor retarder. These include puncture, abrasion, and tear resistance, flame and smoke performance, tensile strength, and of course, the cost. In general, there are some specific materials that are recommended for use as vapor retarders in LNG pipe insulation applications. For the primary vapor retarder on piping sections, the two most commonly used and recommended materials are like Heather previously mentioned, rubberized membranes, which are expensive, but the most commonly used material, or reinforced mastic consisting of a mastic fabric mastic layering, which is very labor intensive and relies very heavily on the skill of the installer to achieve the desired performance. For the secondary vapor retarder on piping sections, there are two materials typically used. PAP, which is again, as Heather mentioned earlier, polyester, aluminum polyester, or a mylar film. I just wanna remind the audience um, of where the vapor retarders and joint sealants are used in a typical PIR insulation system in an LNG application because there are sometimes, these are sometimes confusing and the locations are slow, shown on this slide. So in a two layer insulation system on the left, joint sealant is used only on the outer layer and there are two vapor retarders, primary and secondary located as shown. And then in a three layer insulation system shown on the right, Joint sealant is used on the second and third layers, but not on the first layer. There are still two vapor retarders used, however, both as primary and secondary again. So now let's move on to the topic of jacketing, the last material that we're gonna discuss in this webinar here. The main purpose of jacketing is to protect the system, especially the primary vapor retarder from damage, um, which occurs from physical abuse in sunlight. The most commonly used jacketing is metal and both aluminum and stainless steel are common with stainless steel being used in locations where there is a particularly high concern with either fire resistance or where the environment is particularly corrosive, say by the ocean. Since virtually all large LNG import and export terminals are located on the ocean shore, these environments tend to be really corrosive and stainless steel jacketing is frequently used. In really high humidity environments where condensation control is hard to achieve, the use of painted aluminum jacketing 
can help to avoid having to use excess insulation thickness. So regardless if you use aluminum or stainless steel, all metal jacketing should have a three layer, three milliliter thick factory heat laminated polyfilm moisture barrier on the interior surface. This helps prevent corrosion on the hidden interior surface of the metal jacketing. Polyfilm is not a proprietary product, however, so metal jacketing with this, with this material applied is available from all metal jacketing companies. We are not gonna get into all the details about jacket securement. However, one point is very much worth mentioning here. For metal jacketing on LNG in any cold application, even chilled water at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, only bands should be used to secure the jacketing. If a rivets, screws, or staples are used in areas such as protrusions, then you should install a sacrificial layer of elastomeric rubber over the primary vapor retarder to prevent punctures or damage to the vapor retarder, which is displayed in the picture on this slide. The use of metal jacket joint sealant is also worth mentioning briefly. Um, this is a controversial topic that has not been studied scientifically. The concept is that by sealing the joints with metal jacketing, you are likely to reduce the entry of liquid water through these joints. Um, conversely, there is a school of thought that sealing these joints will limit the evaporation of water from inside the insulation system. No one really knows which approach is better. JM is of the opinion that sealing the metal jacket joints is likely to be the better option, but we do leave it to the specifier to make this decision. Um, and when the use of jacket joint seal is specified, it should be applied inside the joint and not as a bead on the outer joint lip. So this actually concludes my portion of the webinar presentation, and now I'm going to turn it over to Heather at this time. Heather? Thank you, Elizabeth. So um, as we keep talking, we are going to now move into the key aspects of LNG pipe insulation systems, the installation of that. So the proper installation is going to be absolutely critical to the success of an LNG pipe insulation system. The best design and the best materials will fail and possibly fail quickly without the proper installation. Proper installation is critical in ensuring that your LNG insulation system operates safely and effectively for the entire lifespan. And it also is going to help make the lifespan a very long one. The first installation priority is to only use insulation contractors with experience in the unique and demanding LNG application. Be sure that your contractors are familiar with the particular insulation system materials that you're going to be using on your project. The installation must be monitored closely to ensure the system design is being followed. And I would pay particular attention to the following areas. The first is the proper location and application of the insulation joint sealant. Recall that this means applying joint sealant in an even and thin layer across the entire joint face of all joints except those on the innermost layer. The second is going to be the continuity of both vapor retarders. Um, so that means no gaps, holes, etc. The third are going to be vapor stops. The vapor stops have to be properly installed. Um, they must connect the pipe to the primary vapor retarder uh, with a vapor tight seal. They also have to be placed where specified and at all insulation terminations. The last is going to be the expansion and contraction joints. Um, you'll want to make sure that, that your contractor is following the proper spacing and construction of those joints. Some outdoor installation tips um, for locations where rain or dew can contact the pipe. Um, we would recommend to only insulate on a given day 
uh, what can also then be covered by the vapor retarder that same day. Um, if exposure of an incomplete insulation system is unavoidable, uh, we recommend that you cover and seal the insulation overnight with tarps, plastic sheets, something to, um, to keep that inclement weather out of the system. So good news is that um, JM has worked tirelessly and have, we have updated our LNG systems guide. Um, this now has content um, on insulating LNGs at lower temperatures and uh, utilizing not only trimer, but other various accessory materials, some which we have and have not covered um, in our presentation today. We also redesigned um, and made our graphics uh, easier to follow. We have added and updated sections, um, including an entire material section, along with adhesives, joint sealants, and mastic section. Um, we also did some more extensive research in addition on information for just the general installation process. Um, there is the QR code on your screen right now. I encourage you to use um, to use that and to download the guide. Um, this is just a newer picture of uh, some of the uh, figures that we have updated. Uh, one is the tanks and vessels, and another would be the saddle hangers. So the last key aspect that we are going to cover today is going to be maintenance. Thorough and regularly scheduled system inspection and maintenance is going to be, once again, another critical aspect to protecting your investment, um, which is going to be your high quality LNG insulation system um, and to be able to achieve the expected lifespan of that system. The frequency of system inspections and maintenance is all going to depend on a number of factors. Um, one would be the ambient conditions. Um, in harsher conditions that are gonna be tougher on the insulation system, you might inspect more uh, system complexity, uh, the age of the system, um, system importance, uh, and the LNG pipe insulation systems are almost always kind of mission critical. And so is the system quality. So if you remember in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the cost performance continuum. Um, the higher performing and higher cost insulation system will end up needing less inspection and maintenance um, than one that is further down on that continuum. So when conducting inspections, what should you look for? You should be looking for moisture or ice, particularly at low spots in the system, um, halfway points between pipe supports or at the foot of any vertical pipe section. Uh, you need to be looking for any holes or breaches in um, both the jacketing and the vapor retarder. Uh, you should be looking for any loose jacketing and banding. As system settles, the banding can become loose, therefore the jacketing is now loose. Um, any caulking failure or other sealants, um, especially at areas like flanges and valves. So if your inspection and shows that repairs are needed, it's important to catch these problems early and then fix them immediately. A small problem, if caught early, is going to be much easier and less expensive to repair and possibly require little or no downtime. Minor problems that are shown, um, no evidence of water or infiltration into the system, um, at or most minor damage, they're caught early, they can pick, be fixed immediately. Um, if the situation can be repaired without requiring a process shutdown, that's always beneficial. But on the other hand, major problems 
are typically those that are going to show significant ice or water on the insulation system. Um, if that's the case, then a shutdown is typically required. The insulation system could be damaged. Areas are going to have to be removed. Um, the pipe is going to need to be inspected for damage or even possibly corrosion. Um, and only then is that damaged portion of the insulation system uh, replaced. So when a section of the insulation system is replaced, it's going to be critical to ensure once again that you have the continuity of or the vapor retarder through the system, um, even in the newer um, replaced section. So to conclude, pipe insulation is very important um, engineered element of your total LNG handling system, and it should be treated as such. The insulation system is not a place for um, complacency or lack of attention to detail in either the specifications or in the installation. Insulation system repairs are costly and can be avoided with proper maintenance and inspection. Uh, installers with experience in LNG applications are also highly recommended. LNG pipe systems are always present, um, present acoustical challenges um, for which insulation systems can help, but this would be a topic for possibly a future JM webinar. Um, properly executing all five key aspects that we discussed today will help ensure your LNG system operates as desired. Great, thanks Heather for all of the information. We have quite a few questions coming in, which is really exciting to see. Um, but I wanna firstly kind of take a few minutes to go over some additional resources that we have. Uh, first and foremost, we do maintain all of our informational resources um, on, a, on our jam.com online portal called The Source. This is where you'll have access um, to all of these rec uh, recorded webinars, including this one. Uh, blogs, product um, specifications, training, and tools. Um, so it's a great place to kind of start and, and, and browse around to see additional information that might be available to you. Uh, we often get asked where we can find the source on jm.com. So here's kind of a, an easy way um, that'll point you to a couple different resources. At the top tab, you'll um, click insulation, you'll click industrial um, insulation, and then you'll see on the right and left sidebar, you have opportunities to either click on the source there or um, on your left-hand side, you'll also see webinars on demand, and that will um, take you to the source as well. Um, there is a full library of helpful information here. As I mentioned, you'll find technical bulletins and white papers and product application guides. So it's a, it's a great place um, to browse this section if you're looking for more detailed information about our products or any of the uh, leading industry issues. Um, as I mentioned, a recording um, of today's webinar will be posted on the source there in the next few days. Um, when it's live, we'll also send you a link for direct access. So if you missed any part of the presentation um, or if you'd like to view the webinar again or, um, or feel that the content might be useful for a colleague, you'll be able to access it on demand. Um, and if you did like the content today, which it certainly seems like a lot of you have a lot of questions, so hopefully you did and don't wanna miss out on future news and events, uh, be sure to um, sign up on jam.com. There's a note here where you can kind of um, uh, sign up to be the first to know on any uh, future JM product announcements, which we have an exciting um, new product coming out shortly. So you definitely want to uh, be in the know about that um, and new educational resources that is available to you. Um, also, because our conversation was so great today, let's keep it going. On our Insulation LinkedIn um, page, we do feature the latest news and insights. Um, as well um, as um, some educational videos on our YouTube page. Um, most recently, we completed a new video series called Insulation Minute, um, which aims to answer industry hot topics and frequently asked questions. I know Heather just mentioned um, about acoustics and acoustics and industrial insulation. We have a great video that's kind of playing right here. Um, so you can kind of be in the know about that too. So another great re uh, resource to take a look at. Um, 
And then most excitingly enough, uh, we are holding um, a future in-person event, which is very, very exciting. And you're invited. It's called the Industrial Insulation Spec Institute. It's a completely free industrial professional development course. Um, we're holding that at the end of May. Um, there'll be hands-on install demos. You'll actually be able to tour um, our Houston Metal Facility, um, which is a, a great opportunity. And so I'm just gonna leave um, this QR code on the screen um, for just a couple more seconds. So you can kind of scan that. Um, it'll give you a landing page where you'll be able to kind of learn more about that future upcoming event. But we definitely hope to see you see you all there um, at the end of May. And again, we'll send out all of these additional resources. I know we had some comments come in um, about wanting to, to scan the code for the um, uh, Trimer LNG install guide. Um, and so we'll also send that as an additional resource in an email um, following this webinar. So if you missed the QR code, don't, uh, don't fret. We'll make sure we get all that information over to you. Um, oh, and then one last note on this too. Um, uh, we, we will be able to earn some CEU credits as well by attending this event. Um, so if that's important to you, that will also be available to you. Um, as always, you heard from Heather today, but we have a fantastic JM technical support team. Um, so if you have any questions or feel um, you need any more clarification on anything, it's a great resource. Um, and uh, please reach out to us at any time. Um, and as a reminder for anyone who attended today, you will receive a certificate of completion after the webinar that may be submitted for professional development hours. And this will be sent to you via email and then should be in your inbox by next week. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, I think we'll dive into some questions because we have quite a few coming in. Um, I'll start with some of the questions we got before the webinar um, and either Heather, um, or Elizabeth, you can kind of jump in and answer these. Um, does JM have any recommended installation guides for joints and ceiling of uh, insulation systems with conventional cladding, aluminum, and stainless? And are there any systems which includes a cladding and thermal barrier as a single system? So we don't have any single system. Um installation guidelines out there. We do have installation guidelines based on the surface temperature of your system. Um, those can all be found on our website. We also have um, installation guidelines for metal jacketing as well that is different, um, that goes into more detail than the insulation installations. Great. Um, and then another co a question coming in about CY. Is CY a problem at lower temperatures? So CUI will always be a concern. Um, and I think that that's probably a more deeper question than we can get into today. Um, but there, it, it isn't just one factor that plays in with CUI. It's going to be the service temperature, it's going to be the pipe, it's going to be water, it's going to be air, your insulation. So um, I would encourage um, whoever might have questions about CUR or want to kind of delve in deeper into that um, to definitely reach out and give me a call um, at the 800 number that Kelsey just put up on the screen and we can discuss that in more uh, detail. Yeah, and I just wanted to also reiterate that Heather is right. Yeah, CUI is is something to worry about at lower um, temperatures as well. Anytime you're insulating any kind of, of pipe with insulation, CUI is going to be um, a concern. Next question, do you recommend adhesive in the insulation joints? So typically if the joints are going to be sealed, they aren't then also adhered with adhesive. Um, so in LNG systems, once again, you want that inner layer, you're going to use like filament tape to hold the insulation around the pipe. 
And then in the outer layers, whether it be two or three layers, you would have the joint sealant that's going to go along that entire surface of the joint. And are there any concerns with the higher flame spread and smoke development of PIR compared to other industrial insulation materials? So if that is part of your system that is of concern, then once again, I would recommend calling and talking to us. Um, while we, JM, do not manufacture cell glass, um, we do have quite a book of insulation options. Um, so if the if the flame is going to be an issue, then then let us help you talk through that um, to determine whether or not PIR is going to be best for your system. And how do we replace damaged insulation pieces on hot pipes? So jumping over to, it's not LNG systems, but hot pipes. I think once again, hot pipes, you're going to uh, do the same thing. The difference and maybe similarity between hot and cold is that they could be extremely hot or extremely cold. So if it is of the hotter end, that's gonna be above any personnel protection, which is typically around 100, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, then you might consider a system shut down just for the safety of your personnel while doing that. Um, and typically on hot systems, you also don't have a vapor retarder. So it's gonna be the insulation and the jacketing. Um, so there's less parts than an LNG system, but you also have probably a very high um, safety factor to consider. Yeah, I, I agree with Heather. I, ideally, you would have to do a, a system shutdown to get the pipe cool enough to where the person could safely handle um, the, the inner layers of insulation. Now, does coated uh, stainless steel or aluminum jacketing, will that help the performance of insulation and support to reduce the insulation thickness? And if yes, what is the basis? So yes, if you are talking about coating like painted jacketing, um, the paint on the exterior surface of the jacketing is going to um, increase the emissivity. And in doing that, it then will decrease typically um, the insulation thickness because the emittance is, um, is higher. So for standard aluminum, the emittance is typically 0.1. Whereas if you switch to a white painted aluminum, it's going to be about 0.8 to 0.9. And so that difference causes a thickness to, to decrease. And Heather, do you just want to define emissivity for anyone who doesn't know it? Is it, is it correct in that it, it's the ability to reflect um, UV light? Is that, can you clarify that? So not necessarily just UV light, it's just going to be its ability to reflect the heat away. Um, so think of something of being of the color black or white. If it's out in the sun, the black object is going to be really, really hot. Whereas the white object is going to be less hot because it is able to reflect the, the heat away. This question is asking, why not apply a product similar to venture cladding, which can double as a vapor barrier and a metal protector? Once again, I think you can. I don't know that much about Venture Clad because it's not a uh, JM product to my knowledge. Um, but we just recommend using an insulation, using a vapor retarder, and then our metal jacketing, which has the moisture barrier heat laminated to the inside. All four of those are, are different aspects of the system that when installed together and properly, are going to give you that longevity. Thanks. Um, and then a couple more. What type of expansion joint do you recommend for insulation differential between insulation and pipe? So I think the biggest thing that, that should probably happen is for that person to download the LNG installation guideline. We have a very wonderful section that just got added into there with detail 
of um, of just that um, the difference between one layer to the next and the contraction expansion joints are typically about three inch minimum. Um, but our LNG guide really does go into a lot more of that detail. Also, once again, feel free to call that 800 number and I will be happy to, to answer some more of those questions in detail. I just put that QR code back up on the screen. So anybody who missed that, um, feel free to scan that and that'll take you to the LNG systems guide. All right, and then um, what is PAP details, the secondary vapor barrier details? I think I'd need more information to that question. Yeah, um, PAP is just a type of vapor retarder that can be used um, just like um, the butyl rubber that we discussed for the primary. So there's various vapor retarders and why you would use, choose to use one over the other um, is going to be part of your, your system design. All right, great. And then how many um, layers of insulation needed in an LNG storage tank? So the number of layers is going to be based on the overall thickness of the insulation. So if you don't know the thickness and you would like help calculating that, please contact us. Um, but typically at about five inch of total thickness is when you're going to break from a traditional two layer system to a three layer system uh, for LNG applications. Um, five, five inches is about that breaking point to which you wanna split it up. Once again, the, the basis for doing that is that you want to create the most torturous path possible for water and water vapor to, to get into the system. Now switching over to liquid nitrogen um, installs, what uh, differences are there for a liquid nitrogen installation? Um, and are any vacuum jacketing lines used for LNG? I don't know that the JM has done any research or development on vacuum jacketing, so I can't speak to that very much. Um, but LNG systems and any system lower, you know, than the the negative three hundred. Once again, it goes back to designing with a higher cost performance continuum than not. So having three layers of insulation, having two layers of vapor retarders, having the proper jacketing, installing that properly, sealing that properly, all of those, having the proper thickness, all of those factors that we talked about today are what is going to give you the best system possible for LNG systems, and then all the way down through that that negative three hundred um, temperature range. We have a, another question coming in, just on clarification for the need of a vapor retarder, um, uh, even though PIR and cellular glass are both closed cell. So the to me, the closed cell nature of the insulation does not necessarily mitigate needing a vapor retarder. Uh, vapor retarders have a permeance rating, which is the amount of water that can pass through that particular product. And to include that in the system is important because once again, it adds another layer, it's going to be um, continuous through the entire insulation system. Therefore, you, while joints would be weak spots because you've now covered them with a vapor retarder that typically has a, a very low permeance, um, you're looking at just one more added layer of protection to keep water out of the system. Then um, just on the note of a vapor retarder um, jacket with a perm radiance, um, this question's coming in asking when comparing a vapor retarder jacket with a perm rating of 0 0.02 to one that is zero, which one would be more effective? 
obviously a zero perm is going to be higher on that cost performance continuum. So yes, use a zero perm. Um, the more water and water vapor permeate, like you can keep out of the system, the better. And the best way to do that would be to use something that has a zero permeance. Right. Anything with the lower the permeance, the better at, at that, at keeping water out of the system. So you always want lower numbers in terms of perms. And do you uh, recommend a thermal imaging inspection after insulation completion? I'm not sure we've ever recommended that. I don't know why we would. Elizabeth, did you want to add anything to that? Kelsey, was it, repeat the question one more time. Was it right after installation or? Yes, after uh, installation completion. Um, the only time I've ever, and, and Heather, jump in if I'm incorrect here, the only time I've ever heard of the thermal imaging is is farther down the road after installation, not immediately after. Um, I, I could be mistaken, but that is from what I've seen. So um, immediately after installation, I I, I, I can't necessarily say I, re I recommend that either way, just because I'm unfamiliar with that. I think you'd want to do it after the system was running, obviously, or if yeah. you were doing an inspection and maintenance, if you notice some sort of damage. Um, I think there are probably time and places for that. Um, I don't know that it would be beneficial right after the installation before the system has had a chance to um, to turn on and to start running. Right. I, you were, that's exactly what I was going to say. You just said it a lot better. <laughs> well, we have um, a lot of questions. Um, and, you know, shortly, <laughs> too, too short of a time to answer all of them today. But I put up the technical support number um, so that all of these questions, if you have further questions, certainly reach out to Heather and our technical support team. Um, we are here for you to answer um, all of these questions. Um, and then we do have a list of, of um, some of the questions that we weren't able to get to today. And we will also submit them to our technical support team to hopefully get some, some answers out to you guys. But uh, we appreciate all of your time um, this afternoon. Um, and we really hope this webinar was uh, uh, informative. So um, thank you so much and, and have a great rest of your week.